Hi. It's time. Um, today is April 11th, 2018. It's 9 o'clock, and this is panel number 3007, um, entitled Monetizing Creativity, Make Your Idea Happen. Um, <clears throat> excuse me if I seem a little nervous. This is only my second time moderating a CWA panel. And last year when I um, moderate, moderated, I didn't quite know what to expect, even though I had been one of you in the audience before. Um, and our, uh, two of our panelists on the panel that I moderated broke out into song. And so um, I didn't see that any of our panelists brought instruments, so I hope you guys got your voices warmed up. I had really high expectations because I was on that panel last year, yes. so hopefully someone here can give us yeah. a performance. We're looking for magic. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, so uh, before I get started, they're making, or we need to uh, make these announcements. In the CWA session, we will utilize both the CWA app and a note card system to receive questions from the audience. To ask a question on the app, simply select this session on the schedule and um, tap Q&A. And then you can type in your question and send it, and it'll come straight to me. Um, you can also raise your hand and request a note card and pencil from one of our producers. Our producer today is Melanie, and she is back there in the white shirt. She'll have the, the cards. Um, you must write legibly if you want me to read it. Um, if you're a student, please note this on your question and make your questions brief and to the point. Uh, so I, my name is Cindy Sapuka. I am um, the executive director for a Boulder Visual Arts nonprofit, Open Studios. And um, our mission is to support local artists through events and teaching opportunities. I also have a background in um, running my own creative business. Uh, I did about 10 years operating a business that specialized in murals and specialty finishes in the go-go 90s when everybody was spending lots of money on their house, because we don't do that anymore. Um, <laughs> Um, so I have a bit of a background in this, so I think that's why they chose me. Um, so first of all, I, I wanted to introduce, do quick introductions of our panelists, and then they're going to do some, some um, opening remarks. Our first panel, panelist is James Tanabe, and interesting fact about him, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but when I talk about, when I have described him um, as somebody on my panel, I say, he's this guy who's done a lot of stuff, but I think what's most exciting is his headshot, which is a picture of him doing like a plank, but it's elevated and he's holding his whole body up with one arm. So that's the kind of stuff this guy can do. <laughs> and then we have Kate Lesta, who um, it, she's a former Boulderite and now lives in San Francisco. When, when she lived here, she operated, she created, managed, kind of ran this whole um, festival called Community Festival, and it was all about um, the creative process, specifically dealing with sound design and technology, and that was always around the same time as the CWA, so she, uh, this is one of her first chances to actually come and participate, and she gets to as a, a panelist this year. Um, and then Jerry Mikowski, uh, interesting thing about Jerry is that he has published his brain online, and it's free to anybody who wants to take a look, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, as we Looks like delve. <laughs> um, next we have Mara Chiteo. I'm sorry. Um, Sh Mara Chiteo. And a very interesting th thing about Mara is um, she's super intelligent. She has a hard time pronouncing her own name. <laughs> she said that that was okay if I shared it. <laughs> And last but not least, Elliot Pepper, who shared with me a very interesting story about when he just first realized that he was unemployable. It was back in high school. He took a, um, an internship with uh, California State Senator Leland Yee. He showed up on his first day all dressed up in his suit and being all excited about his first job. And he found it to be super soul crushing and realized that he never ever wanted to go back. He did have to finish out his internship. So he did that, but realized that he was, um, he was probably unemployable. Um, and he's pretty happy about his decision because apparently Leland Yee was arrested 
by the FBI for running arms, money laundering. He's basically the political overlord of um, organized crime in San Francisco. So he uses him as, as inspiration for a villain in, uh, for villains in uh, his, his novels that he writes. Okay, so let's start off with, um, we'll just go down the line. Start off with James, um, just kind of opening remarks about the, the topic, which is monetizing creativity. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, excited to go first on this panel. I just want to clarify that I'm not a very good circus artist. Mm -hmm. So the advice that I have is probably not directed in any way to the amazing artists who may or may not be in this room. If you're an amazing artist and you're the best in the world, you need none of this advice because your work will speak for itself. People will seek you out and they will pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars to do what you do. You don't need me. I probably have a lot more to learn from you than you have to learn from me. For the rest of us who are average or sub-average in creative endeavors, there's a lot of really basic business tools that can be used to earn our livings from the work that we do creatively. Uh, these, these business tools, anyone who's done any study in business or has done their MBA would probably roll their eyes and say, I can't believe you're using these super basic tools in front of an audience as sophisticated as the one in front of me today. But what's interesting is not the sophistication of these business tools. It's the application of the most simple business tools to an industry that most people never think about as a business itself, which is the creative industries overall. So if you are a business person and you are rolling your eyes, think about how you would apply these tools to the creative impulses that you might have. And if you're an artist, and if none of this sounds familiar to you, don't worry, I'm going to use my best, uh, I'm going to try my best to use circus examples to illustrate each one of these business tools. There's three, if I have time, I'll also do a fourth. So the three business tools that I'm going to be walking through with you uh, this morning is first what we call Porter's Five Forces, which is a tool to understand the global environment, the global landscape of any industry. The second is the five C's, the five C's of positioning, which helps you understand who you are, what you do, and how you interact with that industry that you've discovered using Porter's Five Forces. And then the third tool that I'll be talking about is the four P's of marketing. So this is once you know what your industry is, once you know where you want to place yourself in that industry, what do you actually need to do in order to design a product, price that product, and start distributing it to your potential customers. Okay, so like I said, it sounds dry. I'm walking a very fine tight wire because for the business minds, this may be too simple and for the artistic minds, it may be too exotic. But let's go there together. It's a high wire act. <laughs> it is, and as I already said, I'm not a very good circus artist. <laughs> um, before we move on to Kate, I just wanted, I forgot to um, make a quick announcement. I would like everybody to take out their phone right now and then look at it and turn the ringer off. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Kate. Um, oh, I, I was going to talk about those. Should I talk about them later oh, or? Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, let's. We'll talk. About okay. Them. Later or? Uh, we'll do it later. Okay. We'll have each. We'll, yeah. Okay. No worries. <laughs> so stand by. <laughs> um, Thank you for having me. Thanks for the introduction, Cindy. And um, one of the things that's been on my mind with this specific topic is looking at the difference between monetizing creativity and making your ideas happen. I feel like these are actually two different concepts, and so I'm sort of interested in exploring um, the difference between those ideas. And I think for a lot of artists that there's this struggle to uh, convert, um, like. Why, why should I have to monetize my, my creativity? And um, so that's been kind of where my mind has been going with this topic is, is uh, how do we make our ideas happen? And then how do we convert those ideas to uh, something that can help us earn a living? And they're not necessarily always the same thing. So that's kind of been my initial thoughts. Cool. Um I'll pick up immediately from what Kate just said because uh, long ago art was religious. It was uh, it was the pra you know a lot of art was how we knew what we knew and where we were in the world and all of that. And then we've monetized everything. So I think the the title of this panel is kind of funky that way. And that monetizing creativity is almost an oxymoron. But by the way, people who are creative need to stay alive. 
and how you know how we do that is the dilemma. But but often adding money to this thing, like the concert last night was beautiful, partly because these artists are showing up under the umbrella of how CWA operates, which is itself beautiful. And this is gift economy, right? Everybody's putting in effort um, and showing up here to do this thing together, which is really nice. I'll tell really briefly the story of my brain. I used to be a tech industry analyst, a trends analyst, not a Wall Street analyst. And I probably saw 4,000 startups. I was, at the, I was on duty during the dot-com revolution. Uh, and then one of the companies that comes by has a product, a mind mapping product called The Brain. And when I make the appointment, I'm like, The Brain, right. A little eye roll, right? And then the moment the inventor sitting next to me opens his laptop and shows me this thing, I'm like, oh, that's kind of how I think. My dad was a civil engineer. He used to draw things to explain them to me. I like, I'm a very good pattern finder. It's one of my little superpowers. So I started using this piece of software back then. That was 20 years and four months ago, right? December of last of 2017 was the 20 year anniversary of my using this piece of software. I have a little t-shirt autographed by the, 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 the founder uh, to celebrate the fact. And, uh, and um, I did not expect I'd still be using it. And the file that I just showed you is the same file that I started 20 years ago. So I have in one mind map, everything I've cared about for 20 years from cocktail recipes, breeds of dog, um, uh, community land trusts, uh, ways of revitalizing cities. Imagine if the top three or six questions in your mind, the things you really care about, imagine if for 20 years you'd been connecting them up and patiently kind of curating them under the same topics and then linking them to each other. And when you read a great article or saw a great TED talk, you actually kind of debriefed into the same space. It's really interesting. I'll talk more if, if anybody's interested about the lessons from that. But there's an app in the App Store that's called Jerry's Brain that has my face on it. Only works on iOS, there's no Android version. And uh, don't try to install it on your phone. There's not enough screen real estate on the phone for this thing, but it looks really pretty on a tablet. Um, and I get 33 cents per uh, download because I get a third of a buck. And um, Apple gets a third and the developers get a third. And I'm not gonna leave my day job for this because I make like four bucks a month on that. And that is the only way this thing is monetized. Um, I've done, there's no other way in which I make a living from this. This is a labor of love. If you go to jerrysbrain.com on the web, no apostrophe, no space, Jerry with a J, uh, you can browse it for free. So this is a labor of love that I put in the world on purpose. And the whole idea of protecting IP is another issue I'd like us to get into because I think, you know, uh, in, in the book, The Gift, uh, Lewis's, Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift, he says, artists are gifted and their gift is to the world. The fact that they need to stay alive and be able to eat is, is, a, is a different issue, and we shouldn't conflate those, but we do, because we're in, we're in the monetary economy and we've monetized everything. So, um, actually, I'll, I'll leave it there. Hi, um, I'm Maria and I'm an undergrad um, sophomore student right now back in Boston. And so my approach to the, to the topic of this panel and how I've approached it so far in the last three years in which I've been, I kind of launched my ventures and have started doing my own things has been, how can I use my creativity to solve relevant problems in my community, first of all, and then how can I monetize it? I really believe that it all starts from identifying a relevant problem or a relevant opportunity that other people relate with you, with you on. So, to take this approach further, when I was back in uh, high school in, in my country, in Romania, I was 17, and I realized that financial literacy is a huge problem in my community and all over the country. Young people didn't know how to manage their personal finances. So I thought, how can I solve this problem in a creative way? So I launched a financial education mobile game for public schools from within the country to approach the topic in a fun, lovable way. And um, so, I, so I continue these flows of entrepreneurial ventures. I can talk more later in the, in the field of education. And my point is that entrepreneurs, problem solver, intrapreneurs within big companies, big corporations, because employees in companies usually think, oh, I'm just an employee day by day. I'm not an artist. I don't have anything to do with that. My work is boring. I would dare to, to challenge that. As long as you improve processes, as long as you see problems around you and you come up with creative, innovative ways to solve them, you are an artist. Why? Because it's risky. It involves risks. You put yourself out there. Second of all, it's human. It's empathetic, you need to understand whether your ideas, how your ideas are approached by others, whether they can empathize with you, whether you can bring other people 
with you. It's also new and valuable. So I think as long as you solve problems, you are an artist, you are creative. So the question is how you, how you monetize it. And I can go into a bit more details later on, but that's, that's kind of my, my perspective and the context from which I will approach the topic of the panel. Thank you. So I, when, I, when I saw this panel topic, um, you know, the, the immediate thing that came to mind was I actually really don't know how to monetize anything except for creativity. Um, uh, you know, like if you, look, if, if you look around yourself and examine like, I don't know, like your credit card history for the last week, you'll probably very quickly notice that for, the fo for most of the folks, at least in this room, a lot of your purchases are for things that go far beyond your basic needs, right? And uh, you know, every time you're buying a fancy coffee that that shows the single origin from a little estate in Colombia and has, you know, I don't know, beautiful design on Pearl Street, you're purchasing creativity. Every time you, um, you know, you go to a Cirque du Soleil show, right? Uh, you're 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 purchasing creativity. So we often sort of conflate like uh, creativity is something exclusive to this like false circle we've drawn around the arts, which is um, like, that's certainly true. All arts require creativity. But I think that, uh, you know, the most interesting thing in today's economy is that I actually think it's really hard to, to monetize anything except for creativity. I, I used to, you know, I, I started my career working in a number of tech startups and then worked for a venture capital firm where we were investing in companies doing new things. And, uh, and, and then I started writing novels. And I've really found that there's way more intersection between all of those disciplines than, than, than they are different. Um, if you're trying to solve a new scientific problem in a new way, uh, you're being creative, right? Um, if you are sketching, you are being creative. Um, creativity is a human impulse, so there are great reasons to just do a lot of it for fun, right? Um, and then if you want to also do it for money, you're not just an artist, you're also an entrepreneur. So you want to you know, bring that lens, and I think that's the lens James, James is going to hopefully walk us through. Um, you, know, you need to bring that lens to your work, right? But, uh, but I, I think that, like, I mean, honestly, if you look at what, what, how, how like, jobs in our economy are changing, like, like it really, it's good you're here because it makes a lot of sense to double down on creativity. If you're doing something that's really rote and not particularly creative, that's the easiest thing to automate, right? So, um, so I think that we will increasingly see monetizing creativity being the thing in the economy, and I think that for the most part, um, it already is. Um, <clears throat> And, and I guess like just on top of that, I mean, uh, I don't think that there has ever been a better time to start the journey towards becoming a creative entrepreneur, right? So all, wonderful if you're doing it for fun, but like there are so many more tools at your disposal if you actually want to make a living with something you are making um, than there ever were before. Like I'm a novelist, um, you know, like today when you go to publish a book, like, you can go to any of the large publishers that you could have gone to in the 70s. You can also self-publish, right? You can also go to a bunch of small presses that are all essentially only available because of the internet. And that gives you leverage, right? So when I go and I negotiate with a publisher on, on a new book deal, I know that I have options, right? I wouldn't have had those options in the 70s. And that would have severely impacted my ability to negotiate a fair deal. Right, and and that's true in music. It's true in filmmaking. It's it's true in every uh, every area that I'm familiar with or that I have friends working in. Um, so so there's never been a better time to start monetizing your creativity. And if you're not monetizing your creativity, well, you're probably not in this room. But uh, but you know you might want to start thinking about it because it's it's going to be even more important later. Thanks. Um, I think uh, I, I really appreciated. Uh, James's uh, B-School kind of nuts and bolts approach. So let's hear your three or four points. Um, I think everybody's waiting to take notes on that. <laughs> sure, so I think it will take me about two minutes to get through each of these three. Uh, the first one is, is Porter's Five Forces. And this tool is used to basically identify uh, for a given industry how easy is it for a player to monetize. And this is Michael Porter who wrote a big book about this. Yeah, very famous book. Some people say it's outdated, but I still find it a useful tool. So, 
Uh, the five forces, so all of them have to do with how things work in this industry. The first one is, what are the threats of new entry? So if you are a player in this industry, is it easy for someone else to come in and start playing as well? And the example I'll use for this framework is a trapeze act with six people flying up high in the air versus a contortionist who's a person who's very, very flexible. So in the case of a contortionist, the barriers to entry are actually quite low. Anyone who decides they want to start developing their flexibility would be able to say, all right, I'm now playing in the contortion industry. Whereas anyone who wants to play in the trapeze industry has to first build a giant rig, has to find a team of people who are willing to throw and catch them. That's an example of an industry with higher uh, barriers to entry, harder to enter that industry, okay? So generally speaking, it's better for a player if it's harder for other people to enter because it's keeping the industry small and keeping it, uh, keeping it easy to protect. The next is the threat of substitution. So how easy is it for someone to say, I don't like contortionist A, I'd rather work with contortionist B? And generally speaking, in both of those examples, it's much easier to, uh, to replace contortionist A with contortionist B because there's so many more contortionists in the world compared to how many troops there are flying trapeze. There's about a dozen or so flying trapeze acts in the world, but there's hundreds and hundreds of contortionists in the world. So again, what you're looking for is very difficult to substitute one player for the other. That tends to be very good to monetize in, in creativity. The next that we look at is the supplier power. Okay? How hard is it, if I'm playing in this field, to negotiate with the people who provide the inputs for that field? So for a contortionist, it's very easy. There aren't really that many suppliers. It's basically whoever is supplying your athletic wear, and that's about it. Maybe whoever is supplying your, your studio space, but you could also probably train at home. But you compare that to the flying trapeze example, and there you have to find a rigging supplier. You have to find someone who's going to build your rig for you, someone who makes a specialized safety net. That's a lot of people that you have to negotiate with who are going to be extracting value from your particular uh, discipline and from your industry. The third, or sorry, the fourth is buyer power. So when you've actually created your product, in the case of a contortionist or a trapeze artist, it's the act that you've actually created. How much do you have to negotiate with the buyer in order to make money off of this act? For both of these cases, your buyer is probably going to be a circus somewhere who's trying to reduce their costs as much as possible. So I would say that in the case of uh, both the contortionist and in the trapeze artist, the buyer has all the power. If you don't find a circus that's going to employ you, it's going to be very hard to monetize that act. The last of the fifth forces is competitive rivalry, which is what is the nature of the actual uh, competition themselves? Is it cutthroat competition? Is it collaborative competition? And again, it really depends on each individual industry. In circus, I'm very happy to say that there's very few cutthroat competitors because everybody realizes that if you screw someone over today, you may be relying on them on a job in the future. So the industry tends to be extremely collaborative, uh, but it's not true of all industries. So what I recommend doing is just think about these five forces of an industry to go through them again. There's how easy is it for a competitor to enter? How easy is it for your product to be substituted? How much do you have to negotiate with suppliers? How much are you spending on your suppliers? How much do you have to negotiate with your buyers? How much are they trying to drive your prices down? And finally, how nicely do people play with each other in the industry? Are people going to try and backstab you and undercut you on prices? Or does everybody recognize that it's better for the industry to try and set prices high? So I just give that as an example for a circus industry, but something that I think is relatively easy to use for an author, for a designer, for a poet, uh, to really think about how, how likely it is for them to be able to monetize the creativity they're putting into that. So I have two others, but it took longer to describe the first than I thought. So if you have any questions about five Cs, which is to say, now that we know how the industry plays, how should I be positioning myself as a creative person? Uh, and then there's the four Ps, which is, all right, now that I know where I'm positioned in that industry, what do I tactically need to do in order to set my pricing and create my products? If you have any questions about those, please feel free to ask in the question and answer period. And, and I'm just you. adding the contortion industry to my brain. <laughs> Actually, while we're on it, we've already had two questions asking you to go over those, so let's just get her done. Okay. <laughs>
All right. The, the, these are actually much easier to describe. I, I, I learned the, the Porter's Five Forces um, for the first time in 2011 when I started my MBA. And I'm only now starting to understand it. So I do recommend reading the book. It does take a long time for it to sink in and for you to start using it in a creative way. These others are much more nuts and bolts, so they won't take quite as much time. So the five C's is saying, uh, what do you want to be? The first of the five C's is the company. Right, so what kind of company do you want to be? Do you, do you want to be a sole proprietor? Do you want to be a group of people? Do you want to be just providing, uh, in the case of the contortion, an act? Or do you want to be an agency that's going to try and find jobs for multiple contortions, contortionists? So this is really the question. What is your company and what do you do? The next is customer. So who is your actual customer? I mentioned before that circuses tend to be the largest employers of contortionists, but there are other employers as well. There's special events, there's movies. Maybe it's better for you to say, you know what, we exclusively provide contortionist services to the film industry. And that's the way that we're differentiating ourselves from Cirque du Soleil, that is their own company that actually employs uh, contortionists. So the second is customer. The third is the competitors. Who is currently succeeding in this industry? Who are the people that I need to be thinking about when I'm thinking about how I'm playing? Are there a lot of contortionists in the market if I want to be a contortionist myself? Are there a lot of contortion agencies in the market if I want to be a contortion agent myself? What are their best practices? What do they do well? What do I think they do poorly that I think I could do better? That's giving me a sense of the strategies that I want to use uh, in my contortion industry. The fourth C is collaborators. Who are the people who are going to help me? Do I have a friend at a major movie studio who I know says, man, I wish I had a lot more contortionists in my little black book of people to call when I have stunts that I need to, uh, that I need to provide on set? Uh, do I have a lot of friends who are agents for, uh, for various circus companies who say, I find it really hard to find contortionists? Is there a school in Mongolia that's particularly skilled at training contortionists? Is this a, is this a relationship that I want to develop? Who are your friends? as you're starting to think about how you want to play in this industry. And the last is the climate or the context. Are you 20 years old, you're just starting out, no one knows your name? Or are you Cirque du Soleil, a 35-year-old company that's the largest live entertainment producer in the world? Is the contortion industry shrinking and it's harder and harder to find people to employ contortionists? Or is contortion booming? Was there an amazing karate kid of contortion that just came out and right now contortionists are the hottest thing out there? You have to understand the context of what's going on because that's going to define whether you're swimming upstream or whether you've got wind in your sails. All right, so those five C's, what is your company? Who are your customers? Who are your competitors? Who are your collaborators? And what is the climate or the context of what's going on right now? Those are the five C's. Again, if you have any questions, please, please let me know. And the last is the four P's. So once you figured out the industry, you figured out how you're going to be positioning yourself into the industry, what do you actually need to do? The first P is product. So what is it that you're producing? What is it that you're selling? If you're a contortionist, it's your own act. If you're a contortion agent, it's the acts of multiple contortionists. What is the product that you actually are going to be putting out on the market? The second piece is promotion. How are you going to let people know what it is that you do? Are you going to be going through digital channels? Are you going through word of mouth? Are you going through a very small and trusted set of people that you feel comfortable working with? What is the best way for you to let people know that you have the product that you have? The third is the place. That could be geographically. Where do you actually want to be setting up? Are you an agency in Los Angeles? Or are you a global provider of contortionist services to the world at large? Do you work in Boulder? Do you work in New York City? These are things that you need to think about. And the last piece is, what is the right price for the services that you're providing? And this, comes a lot to, this, this speaks a lot to how difficult it is to play in your market. If it's very difficult to play in the market, you don't have much control in the price that you can set. On the other hand, if it's a very protected market and you're a very strong player in there, you have a lot of freedom in how to set that price. But those are the four things that you really need to think about tactically, and you won't get it right on the first try. What is your product? How do you promote it? What is the place that you're working from? And what is the price that you're setting for those services? So again, those are just three frameworks that are very simple business frameworks that force you to look objectively at your, at, at, at your industry, at where you've positioned yourself in the industry and what it is specifically you're doing to try and extract value from that industry in order to support your future work as a creative person or an artist. 
So thanks for that. Thanks, James. Um, so that was a, a nice, um, that was great. That was like, what was that, like B-School in, in it's, it's 10 minutes? It's part of a project I'm doing, which is uh, the Artist MBA. Oh, so cool. this is so kind the start of, the of your new podcast. That was the first episode right there. <laughs> there you go. Right there. So obviously that, uh, you know, that's kind of some guidelines on how to operate in the current kind of capitalist system that we live in. And I know that Jerry has some ideas about um, um, maybe uh, being more open with our um, intellectual property, which is definitely a hot topic. If you make something... Um, do you want to receive all the benefits from it or how might that work differently if, if we kind of looked at it differently? So just curious, Jerry, um, about your, your thoughts on that and then anybody else in the um, panel who would like to add to that after Jerry shares, I'd love to hear your ideas. Go ahead. Cool, thank you. Um, so it's hard to stay alive these days and make a living and real full-time jobs seem to be melting. Companies are trying to get rid of full-time employees. So it's like, and then you're creative and who's going to pay for it? How does that all work? So the tendency is to try to overprotect your intellectual property because that appears to be the only thing you can grasp onto and kind of hold so that other people won't copy it and knock you off and then you'll be out of business, won't make any money. I'm trying to figure out the opposite trying to figure out how do we preserve the openness around creation and how do we make a living still while sharing out as much as possible what we're gifted at doing. And I think that, that that's really a bit of a challenge, right? Um, does that sound like a challenge? So who knows what the current copyright term is? Current copyright term, like for a corporate work like Mickey Mouse. Elliot. For, well, for copyright, it's your life plus 70 years. Uh, for and corporate work, for, for your own, for individuals, it's seven years. For corporate works, it's 95 years after the death of the author, right? Uh, who knows what, and, and by the way, everything is copywritten by default now, as a courtesy of the 1973 Copyright Act. So my notes on my page are just copywritten. I don't have to submit them or do anything special. If you pass a napkin to somebody, that's copywritten. Who knows the original Copyright Act, the first one in the Western world? Statute of Anne, 1710. The term is 14 years. You have to apply renewable once. So the maximum is 28 years from the publication of the work in the era of the printing press and ships crossing the ocean. What the hell happened? Right? And then if you look at the earnings from a work, there's a big spike at the beginning if you do well, and then the sucker tapers off. But we insist on protecting this. The 1998 Copyright Term Extension Act, passed under Clinton, one of the reasons I don't like him, um, what basically um, extended copyright another 20 years to this 95-year mark because Mickey Mouse was about to fall into the public domain. It's also known as the Mickey Mouse Act or the Sonny Bono Act. He was the sponsor. Remember Sonny? Um, so, so lots of people are doing really creative things about, about feeding the commons and then participating and then making a living on top of that. So, uh, and, and one of the things, I have a Patreon page up on Patreon, which has been a godsend. It's been lovely. Uh, so I'm making $1,500 and change every month from people who like my work on trust. So I'm not a painter, I'm not a contortionist, although I'm seriously considering now, but <laughs> you, don't, you do not want to see my splits. Um, um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to sort of plumb the world of trust, and I think that's a creative endeavor. So I really love how, how my, the two panelists on my left both said design creativity is really, really broad. What we're doing is, is creation, right? So Patreon is a lovely platform that lets people back me or whoever for their pursuits. And if they can't convince people to back them, nobody backs them. So I think things like that are now available that allow you to put your work in the world openly, much more so. There are far more complicated ways of doing this where you sort of nurture a commons and then make a living by doing services. So we talked about my brain. I've been toying for a couple of years with the idea of doing uh, an online show called Inside Jerry's Brain. So anybody know what Twitch TV is? So there's a whole new realm of eSports. I'm surprised there's not, I don't think there's an eSports panel at CWA. There's kids making a million dollars a year who are the top stars playing shoot 'em up games with audiences and huge screens and arenas, the whole thing, right? Um, so on Twitch TV, which is one of the couple major platforms to go watch eSports, you can get paid. You can also find programmers doing live programming, and people are learning how to program by watching coders share their screen and talk through what they're doing. They're making a living too. So I was like, why don't I go on Twitch TV with my brain? Sounds a little weird, but I could, I could sort of make some money from doing that. 
Now, my major gig is I'm a consultant, so that's how I sort of make a living. But it's, it's really intriguing to me that that's easily at hand. Like, I, it would not take a lot of work or technology for me to go do that. And as Elliot said, th there's just this insane, lovely variety of, of tools at hand that anybody can go use to do this. My advice is to try to not protect your intellectual property very much, figure out how you can live by sharing that, and create communities, do whatever else. I, I can hop in on that. Oh, sorry. Go okay. ahead. Okay, I'll go in. Yeah, yeah. So, Monty, so that's, great, uh, that's great advice about intellectual property. And I also. Closer to the mic. Oh, so, usually, I've noticed that entrepreneurs, are artists, explore the concept of uh, IP once they've launched, right? Okay, so I launched. Now, how do I protect these ideas? How do I ensure it doesn't get copied? But there's a lot of sharing before launching something because too many entrepreneurs, so too many entrepreneurs launch their own businesses, too many artists put their art out there and they realize, well, no one wants this. No one, no one wants to buy this. What am I doing? It's not, usually artists tend to think, oh, build it and they will come. No, it doesn't work like that. So it, it's a whole strategy before launching, which implies a lot of sharing and a lot of testing your assumptions. And it's an entire process that is kind of both entrepreneurial and it definitely applies to arts as well. So first of all, as I was mentioning, you identify a problem, an opportunity on the market. People want to explore new art. They, like even art movements going to uh, Cuban, Cubism, Impressionism. We've had all these movements, all these changes. People wanted something new, a new, new forms of art, of expression. So you realize there is a trend. You realize people need something new. You identify the problem and opportunity. Then you go out of the building and you test that assumption, right? Is this only on your head or do other people feel the same way as you do? Because the main problem why entrepreneurs and um, even in the arts, um, arts industry fail is that they solve a problem that did not exist on the market from the beginning. That's the main reason for failure in, the, in, in business in general. So you have to test your assumptions and um, your assumptions on the market and your hypothesis. Once you realize that, yes, there are other people who, who agree with you, who kind of empathize, and they feel the same problem as you do, you start exploring a solution. And that's how you apply your creativity, either through art or through whatever other means. And then you go out, create a prototype, and go out and test your solution. That again Im involves putting your ideas out there and risking to have them stolen, but there's no other way to to, to test your assumptions because you don't want to launch and have no one want your art because there's a lot of time investment, there's a lot of money investing in, in the whole process. So there's an entire uh, continuous testing and continuous risk of having your idea stolen even before launch. So IP is usually after launch, but before you do that, you have to take the risk and be aware that there's an entire process before. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I wanted to explore. Yeah, so taking that a step further, I mean, there's no faster way to guarantee failure if you're trying to raise money for a startup than to ask the investor you're trying to pitch to sign an NDA before you tell them about your idea. Yeah. Like, NDAs are gone, Yeah, I mostly. Mean, like, it, like, you will be laughed out of the room. So, uh, you know, a uh, non-disclosure non agreement. Yeah. So it's a contract that, prom that where the investor promises to never tell anyone else about what you're about to tell them, right? Uh, this happens almost all the time. So like many, many, many first time startup founders at, like ask investors to sign an NDA because they're super worried that there are just hordes of people out there waiting to take their idea and run with it. Um, and that's the, that is the, like ideas are easy. Ideas are cheap. Like, like there are way, I mean, how many, I, I'd be really surprised if every single person in this room had not once said, oh man, come on, like Facebook, like I had that idea tw 20 years ago. Or it doesn't have to be Facebook, it could be like, look at that new restaurant that opened. Like, uh, you know, I, I always wanted to do a Mediterranean fusion place, or you know, right? So uh, it happens in politics too. Um, and, and, uh, and it really, uh, like you said, it, it frames the problem in the wrong way. Uh, you know, Jerry was talking about IP law. If you ever want to go down a rabbit hole of really dysfunctional policy, uh, it's true on every side of IP law, from the patent system to uh, to copyright itself to DRM, which is like the biggest digital rights security. management. Yeah, sorry, this is a, an electronic lock. So if you produce music or or books or anything like that, and you put it <laughs> online, it's a piece of software that's supposed to protect people from pirating it. Um, it doesn't work. 
uh, anybody who can use Google can break DRM anyway, but any company using DRM introduces enormous cybersecurity risks into their entire system, which we won't go into here today, because that's, that's a bit of, a, that's a, bit of a, a side note. But one thing I would say is that I get, I get emails uh, pretty frequently um, from well-meaning readers who say, hey, Elliot, um, I just found your book on BitTorrent or on, you know, one Thanks of the so much. Yeah, myriad other, uh, you know, pirating sites. And, and the email is really sweet and well-intentioned. They, they are, uh, they like the books. They want to make sure I'm making money from the book. So they're expecting me to go to the publisher or to go directly um, uh, and send a cease and desist and try, you know, basically try to get this pirated copy taken down. And my response to every single one of these emails is, that's awesome, right? Like, maybe you should go share it on social media that the fact that it's like up on BitTorrent because, um, because the more people, if people are willing to steal your work, that means they like it, right? Like, <laughs> like, like if you can make something worth stealing, that's amazing. Like that's, that's success. Like the biggest problem that, the biggest business problem that any artist faces, no matter what your field uh, of expertise is, is obscurity. If, if you overcome obscurity, it's easy to make money. Right? Like you think Beyonce has a problem like with monetization. Once you have an audience, there are t Patreon charging for stuff directly, doing talks, doing, going to shows, releasing new kinds of media content. You're going to have people pitching you trying to get, trying to give you money to do stuff, right? Like HBO is going to come to you and want you to do a shit. Like, all, like that's, that's how the game works. And so, you know, like if, if people are stealing your stuff, like take that as a compliment. I mean, I know that I stole a lot of music when I was in college myself. I didn't have the money to buy it, and I, I used every pirating site I possibly could. And for the bands I loved, I now pay for a lot of their stuff, right? I go to, I go to their shows. Like they make a lot more money off me because I became a fan initially through pirated works. Apparently this is a tornado heading for I know, what is going on? Um, yeah. So, you know, you, th that can be, that can feel overwhelming if you're starting out because you're like, oh my God, Beyonce, right? Like, how do I, how do I, like, okay, well, well, nice, well said, Elliot, right? How do I actually get there, right? Like, we can't all be superstars. We're not all going to be making blockbuster movies. And the, there is one really practical place to start, and I would really highly recommend everyone in this room read this very short essay called 1,000 True Fans by Kevin Kelly. So if you just Google 1,000 True Fans, it'll pop right up. And uh, it, it's actually a great compliment to all of the concepts James was introducing earlier. Um, and the basic logic is that no matter what you make, whether you're a saxophonist, whether you're an author, whether you're a circus act, um, uh, if you, can, if you can develop an audience of 1,000 people who absolutely love your stuff, so we're not saying, we, this is not like, oh, they, you know, like went to one of your shows because their friend invited them and like they had an okay, you know, they had a good time and that was it, right? No, you, we're talking about people who are like obsessive roadies, right? Who are going to be going to every single thing you ever do, buying every single thing you ever make because they just, your work resonates with them so much that it is a, a part of their identity. It's a part of their truth. And if you can find 1,000 people who, who, who love your work, you can make a living, right? Like, you don't have to be Beyonce. Like, Beyonce certainly has many more than 1,000 true fans. But if you have 1,000 true fans, you can make enough to, to make a decent living in the modern economy. And in fact, like, those people become your ambassadors to the world, right? So they are both the people who are probably spending the most money on you, and they are also the people making you the most money because they're the ones going out and proselytizing your work. Um, so I, I really recommend that as a quick, easy follow-up, and that has certainly shaped my perspective on my own creative and entrepreneurial endeavors for years. A 30-second add to one of the stops on Elliot's tour. Um, if you're a first-time author and you strike a deal with Harcourt Brace or Penguin or whoever, your royalties might be three bucks a book, and you're sort of lucky to get three bucks a book. If somebody sends you five bucks on Patreon, you're ahead. And let them steal your book. 
Yeah, I mean, actually, as an aside, there, uh, I have I have worked with small publishers, large publishers, and I've self-published. On a self-published book, I make seventy percent of the purchase. Much price, better margin, right? On on a published book, depending on format, I'm making more like. Uh, you know, fifteen to twenty percent. Like it depends whether it's an audio book, an ebook, or a physical book, right? But you can you can very quickly see that if I sell a hundred thousand copies with a publisher, that's a very different financial outcome than a hundred thousand copies self-published. So you know, you, you can really do things in in many different ways. Um, Kate, I was I wanted to get back to you about um, kind of your your comment about the. Um, how monetizing creativity and making your ideas happen are two different topics in your mind. And I'm just curious to hear you kind of break that down for us. Um, well, uh, just one quick thing is that uh, that 70% self-publishing uh, also translates to the music industry. So that's essentially like a very similar uh, model across. I, I think that 70% you, okay. you self-publish yeah. music, yeah, it's, a, it's the same. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I think that one question that an artist has to ask themselves is, do you want to make money from your art? That's like the first question you have to ask yourself and like a decision that you have to make. Um, I think there's this kind of uh, internal struggle dialogue for a lot of artists saying like, uh, do I want to, you know, do I, am I selling out if I make money off of, off of my creativity? And so that's a decision that we have to make immediately. Like what is this, is this your, your choice to sell your work? Um, to me, making ideas happen, um, and monetizing our work, our, the, the work that the things we have to offer the world are, are two very different concepts. And the reason why is because my uh, first and foremost, I'm a community builder. I think similarly to to James, I, I'm not an artist by trade. I'm an organizer. I'm an organizer of people, and I foster emergent art. So that is my uh, art, if you will. But ultimately, I don't see myself as an artist. I see myself as someone that supports people in creating the things that they want to see happen in the world. So. Then uh, the brass tacks of that is it's about other people. To me, 98% of everything we do is about other people. So then that also mirrors this concept of like sharing ideas. When we, when we uh, develop something, to do it in a vacuum is incredibly hard. We ultimately need each other in order to accomplish just about anything. So um, to, I, I think that the, that the, the idea of trying to hide, you know, to batten down your, your hatch around your concept is, um, is sure you can approach it that way, but it's not the way that I would approach it. And it's not the way I would encourage people to approach how you create things because um, your peers or your communities uh, or your family members, or your friends are gonna have a way to help you create the thing that you want to make happen in the world. And when you work together, you know, strength and unity tends to make make it so that you can actually bring something to life. Um, uh, uh, one th thing on the intellectual property, if you're interested in exploring more of these ideas, I think that uh, for those of you that don't know about Creative Commons or Copyleft, that's a really important resource for looking at intellectual property rights and, um, and open source. Uh, so that's just a, a great... Uh, Platform. This means I agree. <laughs> this means I disagree. Um, yeah, so that's like my, th those are my initial thoughts around that, I guess. Thank you. Sure. Anybody have anything else on the, anybody on the panel have anything to add to that before we get to audience questions? I just want to add one point that for about 100 years, uh, the people who profited the most from global creativity were actually the people who controlled distribution. So whether that was publishing houses for books or for music, um, it's the people who actually were between the artist and the, and the public. And, and they really had the luxury of just thinking about the business, just thinking about the capitalism of these pieces. What has happened over the last 25, 30 years is that all of those distribution channels have fallen away if you want them to fall away. But what that means is that 
while the barrier that distribution created for the artist is gone, it also means that the services that those distribution players provided have also disappeared. If you can't have one and not the other. So what it means is that if you do want to be an independent artist today, you do need to develop the business skills that used to be outsourced to your distributor. But that's still the best way to get from those 10, 15 percent margins to the 70 percent margins that you were talking about. So uh, it is a great empowering for artists if you're willing to undertake it. Mm -hmm. Can I offer a yeah. one minute story about overprotecting intellectual property? Um, remember the Wright brothers? The, what? the Wright brothers. Mm -hmm. They invented up flying, right? Uh, Arguably. There's a couple other contenders. Um, the Wright brothers were 10 years ahead of everybody else. They invented the wind tunnel. They understood pitch, yaw, and roll. When they went to Kitty Hawk, what they did, they understood what they were doing. And everybody else was like slapping an, an, an engine on top of wings and pushing it down, hoping it worked. Most anybody, everybody else didn't get it. They then started flying, and reporters started showing up at their field near Dayton. And they stopped flying. They basically said, oops, we don't want anybody to come steal our ideas. We don't want people to film because the movie camera starts around them. Um, so they basically stopped. They then tried to go sell this new airplane thing with the rudder out in front, remember, to the American uh, Army, no takers, the British Army, no takers, the French, the Germans, nobody bought their airplane. This guy named Curtis sells lots of planes. He puts the rudder in the back, sells a lot of planes to armies. So the Wright brothers basically had a 10-year lead, totally blew it, and ended up not making money from their invention pretty much. I would just add one closing thing to what Jerry and James just said, which is that uh, because distribution has, has re the role of distribution has really changed, um, artists, if you want to make any money with your art, if you want it to be more than a hobby, you have to look at yourself as an entrepreneur, even if you're working with a distributor, right? Because that means you're negotiating a licensing agreement. And the, the single easiest way to lose money with creativity is to not read your damn contract, right? Like I've had so many friends in so many industries where, you know, they, they trust, say they had an agent helping them negotiate the deal. Well, they said, oh, well, the agent said the contract was fine, so I signed it, right? And I mean, you'd be amazed. These are, these are smart, accomplished, brilliant people. This is not like they're, I don't know, they're just like, uh, hot-headed or something like it was like this happens a lot so the one thing I guess to add to the uh, the business school the RB school curriculum um, is just like common sense right like if you do, if you're if you're doing any if you're offering anything to anyone and you're and or if you're negotiating any kind of agreement like make sure you understand what the terms are and like you don't like it's great if you learn more about all the concepts that were raised here but even if you don't just like make sure you understand what you're agreeing to and that you think it's fair the, um, the yeah. author of 10 uh, the author of what color is your parachute richard nelson bowles signed a deal with 10 speed press for rights to the book in perpetuity and never got out of it and he managed he, he basically rewrote the book every year which was lovely and he's a beautiful guy who just died recently but he got stuck and and that was a bestseller in fact they had to take the book off the bestseller list because it would always be number one or number two nobody else would crawl up to number one or number two all right um kind of piggybacking on the concept of um supporting things that you appreciate in the whole Patreon um, discussion. Before we turn to audience, audience questions and answers, we would like to just quickly mention that CWA is funded in part through generous community support. <laughs> we hope you are enjoying this wonderful event and would consider a small contribution. It's easy through the CWA, CWA app. Just click on the donate tab or we also have envelopes out at the information booth. So um, with that, I'm going to turn to some of our audience questions. Um, this question is from a student. Um, when um, regarding self-publishing, how best do you make yourself known when you self-publish? And I guess this is mostly for Elliot, but anybody else who has experience is welcome to share. Sure, so um, a few hot tips for self-publishing if you're considering it. Um, one, remember what James just said. Um, if you are self-publishing, you're now not just a writer, you're a publisher. And you need to understand both roles and do both well if you want to succeed. So as an example, um, when I self-publish, um, it is extremely easy to put yourself in the top 1% of self-published work. Very easy. Any, any of you guys can do it. And that is you need to take the production process as seriously as Random House would for a book. 
right? So if you're hiring your cover designer, don't do it yourself in paint or, you know, so I, like, I mean, you'd be amazed. Like that's most self-published material. Many people do not hire editors. Many people do not hire, you know, professional cover designers that are doing really distinctive good work, right? So when I self-publish, I put the book through at least as rigorous an editorial and production process as a publisher does. And I hire freelancers that work with many of the biggest houses. And the, the whole goal of that is that a reader will never know the difference, right? Like, when was the last time you went into the Boulder bookstore and said, oh, you know what? I think I'm going to buy that book because that's a Penguin Random House book. Right? Like, like, that's not a thing. Like, it's not like no one decides to read a book because of who published it. Um, and so all you're doing is you're making a decision because maybe your friend recommended that book or it caught your eye for some reason, right? Um, maybe you read about it somewhere. Um, and so what I, my goal is always to create the most magical and compelling reader experience possible. Right, And so you need to think about that if you're self-publishing. You need to think about how can I make that experience magical and compelling, not just in the story, right, but also uh, in the cover, in the, 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 you know, the pitch text that goes on the back of a book that introduces you to the subject. Right? All of those things are incredibly important because that's how readers discover your work. Um, so, so, I would, so that would be like my big tip if you're considering self-publishing is first of all just like Take the whole, take the entire process seriously, not just writing the rough draft, um, and and that you know that 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 can be you know tough, but uh, but it's that that's the only way to do it. And then uh, with the the question was actually about how do you like get known, right? Like as a, any kind of independent artist, and that's. That's a whole different bag of worms, right? Because that, like, we this is like how do you actually create something that, that you can be proud of every aspect about, and that will really that you know has the opportunity to create a really powerful experience for a reader. And now the question is like, well, how do you get anybody to notice? And it turns out that that second question is is actually not only important if you're self-publishing; it's also important if you're publishing with Penguin Random House or anything else, because most of the time, most of the work in terms of publicity, promotion, and marketing falls on the artist. Um, and I actually think that's, a, in many ways, a good thing, because I regard my relationship with my readers as sacred, right? So like anybody that would want to intermediate that is actually a, more of a threat to me than a help. Um, but that does require that you have to start thinking about, okay, who are the people with whom whatever my work is will really resonate, right? So, like, remember, like, if you're making something for everyone, like, that's, that's, that's almost a, a guarantee of failure. Um, I, had a, uh, I have a new book coming out May 1st, and uh, it was selected for this, like, editor's choice program where they give, uh, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can access it a month early. So you can like download the Kindle copy and, and you know, whatever, a month early. So that's happening right now. And uh, whenever any new piece of work comes out, this is true for authors and I'm sure it's true for any other kind of creative, it's always a really bit of a harrowing personal emotional roller coaster, right? Because you've put so much work into this thing and then w you want it to be received well, naturally. Right, so um, with authors, you'll like all of us. Whenever it's like near launch day, everybody's like refreshing the you know the Amazon page to like see see what's coming up. And one of the things that was really funny is people started posting early reviews of this new novel, and I was I was uh, really excited because what has happened so far is many people are posting five star reviews, and then they're the second most. Uh, you know, like stars of any category of people posting them is one star. So there are a bunch of one star reviews. And I was like, excellent, right? Like this is perfect. Like I, I know that if I make something that some people love and some people hate, that is actually much more powerful than having a bunch of three star oh, reviews God. where everybody thinks it's mediocre, <laughs> right? So, um, so if you're trying to build an audience for your work, try to find those five star people. 
right? Don't try to please everyone. Don't, don't go and, you know, like try to find the people that are just perfect for it, right? And then do everything you can for them and start meeting more of them. Um, and, and that's the, that's the only way that I'm aware of to build an audience outside of luck, which is also just like a huge part of it, right? Like <laughs> luck and timing. Along the lines of this question, last night I had a funny small world phenomenon. I use a little Kindle sort of plugin called Readwise, readwise.io. And what it lets me do is it lets me see all my highlights because I use highlighting in my Kindle app a lot. So this one collects those up and then it'll notify you of yours and other people's highlights and then you get a little email that also says, given what you just read, you might want to read this. And the book it recommended last night is titled, Real Artists Don't Starve, Timeless Strategies for Thriving in the New Creative Age. <laughs> Which actually, when I sort of looked at it, it, looked like a reasonable book for this panel. So I'm like, ooh, that was timely. <laughs> I have to say that um, your last comment about um, making work that's for, making something that's for everyone, if you make the lowest common denominator, if you're trying to reach the lowest common denominator, that's what your work will be. Um, so it's, you have to, that's again, if that's what your goal is, then that's your goal, but for most artists, it's not really what, you know, reaching the most people is not necessarily mean that you're going to create uh, the work that you, that, you really, that you really have the capacity for. Um, my, my thoughts around how you actually, you know, how does any artist or creator build an audience or get their work out there, whether it's self-released or not, um, your most immediate community is your first audience. That's your, that's your actual, the people you're actually working with, the people that know you. And uh, I completely agree with this concept of like the people that will uh, promote you are the people that love your work the most. The, the way that you can reach people is through the people that you know, the people you know right away. And, and that's where I think building an audience starts. Um, so I, yeah, I, compl I, I agree with all of your <laughs> sentiment. Yeah, and I would add to that. So the, uh, and related to the previous idea that we were discuss discussing about intellectual, pro uh, intellectual property. So the only way to segment your market and to get, okay, this is my market entry point. This is the main segment that I'm going to focus on with this piece. Is the only way is to share your ideas and see which is your market, which are, which are the ones that, you, that love you. So as you create the anticipation, if you don't talk about what you are creating, it's impossible to decide what your market is, right? So it's all about sharing and segmenting the market until you get to that market entry point that you'll do anything for to keep them by you so that it increases. But it's all about sharing ideas. So it's like connecting this topic with the previous one that we were discussing. All right, next uh, question from a student. For someone entering a new field, can you talk about balancing the need to be patient and gaining skills on an endeavor with, sorry, gaining, really gaining skills an endeavor will take um, with the importance of being bold, taking action, and learning during the process? Does that make sense? Can you repeat the question? Yes. For someone entering a new field, can you talk about balancing the need to be patient and really gaining the skills that an endeavor will take with the importance of being bold, taking action, and learning during the process? Yeah, patience versus action, I guess. Yeah, so I can talk a bit about that because that's kind of what I've been doing since I was 17. When, <laughs> so back in high school when I said, okay, I will, launch a financial, I will launch a financial education mobile game. I was not a developer. I had no idea. I knew financial education, but I was not an educator. I, I didn't have any connections. No one in my family was an, an entrepreneur. So I had to surround myself with mentors and people who were experts in all these fields. So the first thing you have to do once you have identified a re relevant problem, you tested the problem, because you can do these, these things by yourself, even if you don't have experience. You see a problem in your community, you go out and see whether that's only in your head or that really exists and other, other people perceive it. You explore a solution. You can even prototype it by yourself, but when it comes to actually creating, actually by the time you start prototyping, you need to start surrounding yourself with mentors and experts. So you have to split 
Okay, so you say, okay, I'm exploring this solution. You have to see what are the implications. So I needed a financial educator. I needed developers. I needed what are the components that you need. And then go to the experts in those fields, to the greatest people in those fields, in your community, in your country. You can be bold. So the, another uh, lesson that I've learned throughout is that you just have to ask. People are more willing to help than you usually think they are. Just go out there and ask questions, and the worst thing that you can get is a no, but usually people are more willing to help than you would expect them to. Because I was like a 17 years old girl, no one knew me, so I, I would just go out there and convince a financial education expert to join us. Just put your vision out there and show people that you found a problem that is relevant, that is important, and that, is a, that has a lot of potential, and people will join you. So that's what I would uh, recommend. Test your assumptions so that they believe you, so that you don't just don't go out to them and say, hey, I think we should do this. Test it, make sure that people, people, that there are people who agree with your assumptions and that there is value and potential, and then get mentors by your, by your side. And then always learn throughout the, throughout the process. So it's lovely, you've just described a process of being continuously bold while being patient. <laughs> I mean, like, doing things is the fastest way to learn them anyway. Right, so uh, like I actually think it would be pretty difficult to learn something to mastery if you weren't doing it all the time and, and having to solve the problems that you need to get there. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that the products of what you're doing early on are gonna be any good, right? I, I, if any of you guys listen to This American Life, right? Ira Glass has this famous sort of like idea that you know, if, you're, if you're creative, your taste develops before your skills do. Right, so if you love watching movies, you know what makes a movie good because you love watching movies. If you make your first movie, it's not going to be up to your standards, right? So like you'll watch the movie and you'll be like, I know this isn't the kind of movie that I want to be watching, and that's what guides you. So like that doesn't mean you should stop because you suck at making movies. That means that that is exactly what will help you make the next movie better. Yeah. Another way of looking at the mentors for me is having good referees around you. Uh, people whose taste you, you trust, people who uh, are, are very interested in seeing you succeed, who can tell you this is ready or this is not ready. And I have this both creatively for the creative work I do, and I have it also on the business side when I'm developing business plans. I have kind of a gauntlet of people I trust who will tell me this business plan seems half-baked, you need to look at this, 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 this. Uh, so having those referees around you, I think you can do it if you're starting day one or if you've been doing this for 50 years. I think it's still very helpful. And also I wanted, Go sorry, ahead. sorry. So with regards to the patience part, I realized that for our generation it's really tough to be patient, especially given the instant gratification we get from social media, from internet, our phones, apps, everything. So you really have to resist this temptation because you have to be aware that it will take a long time for you to learn all these skills, to make it right, to to get successful. 90% of the businesses out there fail, so you have to, you have to be aware of that. So it's, it's not easy, but you have to be aware that this instant gratification that we're used to does not apply um, in these types of endeavors, usually, unless you get lucky. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we have to look at our strengths and our weaknesses and look to the people around us to bring in our to bring in the skill sets that we don't have. It's so important to recognize what we're good at and what we're not good at and to, and to ask your community or your mentors or your peers um, or your competitors, how, how can I improve? How can I grow? Hey, I'm not good at this thing and I need someone else who's gonna help me, who's gonna be my referee or who's gonna be uh, my editor. Um, and to patience, uh, to be bold and to be patient, I, I think could be potentially uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, patience is so important in developing one's, one's skill set. It takes, I mean, what is the, it's the 10,000 hours rule, right? Like it takes, it takes a decade to become a master of a skill set and uh, to think that it can happen any faster is, to, is really, you're really fooling yourself in that. Um, we ha you have a whole, a, a whole lifetime in theory, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, why not actually allow yourself to fully grow into a skill set that um, you can become a master of? There's an interesting concept to add to the 10,000 hours to mastery concept, which is called deliberate practice. Because if I sit here and I like, were to write for 10,000 hours, my writing might get a little bit better or I might break all the muscles in my hand. 
Um, but deliberate practice says set, th set your practice up so that you're always getting better and so that you're always pushing the edges, um, which includes give yourself challenges. Uh, so the, the people who got really good at things over 10,000 hours were constantly improving. Um, so there's a difference between the repetition of the thing and the pushing toward uh, new, new levels. Uh, our next question is about outsourcing, which kind of um, is a is a great was the talking about surrounding yourself with people who who know stuff that you don't know is was a great segue. And then you guys started talking about ten thousand hours, and that's great too. Anyway, so outsourcing um, specifically um, to James, have you used outsourcing to research the five C's and the four P's, and how reliable has that information been? to help you, and anybody else who's experienced outsourcing can also attack this question. Um, I outsource it in a certain way. Uh, I always, I use my referees, right? So I do the research that I can do on my own of saying this is my understanding of the industry, this is my understanding of the best place to place myself, and this is how I'm thinking of attacking. But I was just in Tokyo last week and I sat down with a mentor that I have in Tokyo. I said, this is what I've seen. Uh, about the Japanese live entertainment industry, what makes sense, where am I wrong? And in the sense that's outsourcing, because I'm opening myself up to the possibility that I'm wrong, I'm going to have them test my assumptions, test my hypotheses, they're going to point me in the directions of experts that I should be looking at, and, uh, and, and, and in doing that, I'm getting it better. But I'm not outsourcing in the classic sense of telling someone, hey, you figure it out for me because at the end of the day, it's gonna be my venture and I'm the one who's taking the risk. So I don't wanna outsource that risk to anybody else. Be aware that sometimes experts can be completely off, just totally wrong. And you'll find somebody who'll say, no, 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 I wouldn't try that at all. And then you do it and it succeeds wildly. And they're like, oops, I was wrong. So, so don't, don't take their, all their advice completely seriously. And 63.2% of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> True. All right, here's a question from a student. Um, do you have any advice on how to find yourself a creative mentor? <laughs> so, um, let me think. So I think, yeah, I think it's, so there's, I don't see mentors as creative or not creative. I think you need Depends on the endeavor that you are getting. It depends on your endeavor and why, what your purpose is in getting a mentor. But what what I think it's ideal is create create relationships. Don't look for mentors. I think building trust with others, letting time. It's not like you go out there. Oh, I'm looking for a mentor. No, it takes time. You really have to trust the per people that you are working with, the people that mentor you. So I would say, you need to have a either a, you you need to have had interacted with that person in a work environment, or you need you need some previous connection with the person. It's not like, oh, do you want to be my mentor? I've tried that before. I just ask people directly. And they, they, would say, they will say yes, but it's not the same type of strong relationship that you develop. They don't really understand you. You don't really understand them, and it doesn't work eventually. So I think the main uh, advice that I would give is not look for mentors, look for good people with whom you connect, not necessarily having a purpose, oh, I want this person to do this or this or this. Just connect with the good people, share your ideas, your work, and as they become close to you, ask for, ask for, they will naturally become your mentors. It's not like, oh, starting today you are my mentor. It's, it's a very natural process, that's how, that's how I see it. So just taking that a step further, like one really easy way, the thing to keep in mind is like, ne like do not ask someone to become your mentor, or especially if you haven't met them before. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so like, I mean, if you're really, if you go back a long time, you already have an established relationship, you shouldn't need to ask them to be your mentor because they already are. And if you haven't met them yet, which is, it sounds like where that question is coming from, don't lead with that, right? So as an alternative, so let's say, how would you maybe uh, try to get someone to be your mentor who is a superstar in your field, 
right? Because who do you want to learn from? You want to learn from the people who are the best, who have done things that you already have an enormous amount of respect for, right? But those are the people that it's hardest to get on the calendar of because they're really busy. They've already become successful. But like, there are some pretty easy ways that you can get to even really highly placed people. Let's say that you, um, uh, let's say you're in a particular scientific field, right? And so you really love this one super creative scientist in your field, but like no one can get any time with them. Don't send them a cold email saying like, will you, you know, can you please make time for me in your schedule? I need a mentor. I'm, a, I'm an undergraduate. Um, but what you certainly can do is read all of their papers right and if you read their most recent publication and noticed that there was an unanswered question right that their conclusion left out you could absolutely email them and ask hey i read your paper i thought it was really interesting for these reasons and what about x right and to the extent that that question can actually be like answered in a pithy email, that's a great way to start a relationship. It's the great way to start a relationship with any kind of creative person, right? It shows that you've taken their work seriously, that it means an enormous amount to you, and it also shows that you're putting their interests first, right? That you're actually trying to help them do better work. And very, very few people who have achieved that level of success aren't interested in further improvement. So the minute you do that, suddenly now, you're getting to know them, right? Like you, you, they send an answer, you could send a follow-up question, like now you're a person to them. You're, you know, you're actually learning in a really direct way. Um, and so that can be a really good way to sort of like get your foot in the door. I can offer a really functional uh, process to, to open that door. Um, I mentioned what colors your parachute earlier. Uh, one of the things it describes is something called information interviewing. Remember information interviewing, anybody? So basically, you want to know about some field. You want to meet the guru of the field. Uh, make a list of everybody you know who knows anything about it, including uh, your neighbor's boyfriend's dog sitter, like everybody, and rank it from the world's best expert at the top to your neighbor's boyfriend's dog sitter at the bottom. Flip the list and then start contacting those people. You don't need to contact them all, but with each one of them, uh, what do you know about it? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this quest. What do you know? Who else should I talk to? Which self builds the list? And by the time you're halfway down the list, you're pretty much an expert in the field. And by the time you're contacting the expert in the field, you're being referred to them and introduced to them by a couple people who are junior to them in the field. You have a credible entry point, and you've learned a ton. It's amazing how quickly you can get to a pretty high level of knowledge in almost anything by doing that. All right, last quick question, because we have about three minutes left. What is the most important book you've read? Ever? <laughs> Ever. <laughs> well, here, I'll start. So I'm going to cheat. Um, this is not the most important book I've read ever. However, I think it is the book that might be most important for people in this audience interested in this topic. Um, it's called Perennial Seller. It's by Ryan Holiday, who's a uh, very successful author and media entrepreneur in a variety. He, I mean, he ran uh, marketing for American Apparel. He's done all these crazy things. Um, and this book is about 200 pages. It's very readable. It uses very compelling examples from all across the arts and entertainment. And the book is essentially a field guide to, uh, to, to becoming an artist entrepreneur. Um, and he does a really, really good job at breaking down common misconceptions and, and laying out a practical framework to, uh, for anybody who wants to turn their creativity into a business. So once again, that's Perennial Seller by Ryan Holiday. I have two. The first is Give and Take by Adam Grant, uh, which I think will help any artist understand how to manage the desire to give and contribute with the desire to also extract a living from what they do. And the second is Getting More, which is a negotiations book by, I believe his first name is Stuart Diamond, um, which is the only framework of negotiation that me as an artist, that I as an artist have been able to fully embrace because it's about getting more for everybody involved instead of trying to extract value from negotiation relationships. Stuart Diamond. I believe it's Stuart. I know the it last is. name is I'm Diamond. looking at it on Amazon. Okay. Anyone else? 
So in my case, it would be Zero to One, which is written by Peter Thiel. He's one of the co-founders of PayPal, a really influential VC, a bit controversial as well. Um, and his insights are very, very, very interesting. And he explores business from a more philosophical stand standpoint and entrepreneurship from a philosophical standpoint. And uh, he explores how societies should develop both vertically from zero to one by continuously innovating and investing in their technological resources and from one to n by through globalization and diversifying their workforce and everything. So it explores both technology innovation and globalization in, con in the contemporary world. It's a very, very, very interesting book, Zero to One. Zero, zero to One. Zero to One by Peter, Peter Thiel, Thiel. <clears throat> the multi-billionaire. Um, I'll throw in a book that's totally like off topic, but may, d cracked my head open way ago. It's by um, Carl Polanyi, and it's called The Great Transformation. And he's an economic historian, and he's tracing the shift from pre-market society, pre-industrial society, into industrial society. And he talks about how we used to live beforehand, which we have completely forgotten, and what effect it had to go into industrial society. And he says lots of interesting things, including market, uh, market economy requires market society, which means if you need a big labor force that's free to move around, if you need real estate and all that, you've got to push aside, push out all those other ways we used to stay alive. You can't have them exist. Everything needs to be monetized, which brings us back to the topic at hand. Cool. Thank you so much. There were a lot uh, of Carl other questions. Carl Polanyi, P-O-L-A-N-Y. So feel free to ask our panelists um, if they have time to um, chat with you afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you.